I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the passage that we read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the first five verses. Undoubtedly, many of you this week have followed the events that are taking place in Washington, D.C., whether because you're following them of great interest or because they're just unavoidable. Either way, you've had to watch as things unfold in uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, This committee has been going on for about a month almost, uh, trying and we as the American people are waiting for the senators to confirm the president's choice for the Supreme Court. Of course, there's been many things that have taken place, and my purpose this morning in introducing this is not to be political or to um, answer questions regarding the situation, but simply to make some observations. There are many observations we can make about what's been happening, but I want to point out one in particular. As the proceedings of this particular hearing that we're, that is ongoing now, we have seen some rather Uh, flamboyant outbursts throughout the process, particularly early on in the hearings. Some of the senators, it appears, didn't realize what they were there to do. The Senate Judiciary Committee is there to confirm candidates, and their purpose is then to interrogate, in a sense, question, and confirm the validity and the, the appropriateness of those candidates. Really, it's all about the selection. It's not about the senators. They're there to ask questions. Well, some of the senators apparently didn't know that because they took the opportunity to make broad sweeping statements to speak not to the, the candidate, but to speak to their voter base, especially a few senators in particular, ones whom many are saying are contenders for the 2020 presidential election. They've been making themselves known publicly, we'll say it that way. And I'm not the only person who observed this. Uh, Folks in the media and all around noticed it. Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa, who is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, pointed out and condemned some of his colleagues for what he called grandstanding in the hearings. Grandstanding, according to the Oxford Dictionary, as a verb, means seeking to attract applause or favorable attention from spectators or the media. That's a pretty good definition for what was happening. Whether you want to call it grandstanding or stealing the spotlight or stealing the show or just plain showing off, it's all kind of the same thing. It's putting all the attention on yourself when really it belongs somewhere else. And that kind of behavior we might expect from Washington, D.C. Here are career politicians who are constantly pointing the attention back to themselves. Doesn't really surprise us then to find it. But there's another place where grandstanding takes place all too often, even more inappropriate than a Senate Judiciary Committee. And that is in the Church of Jesus Christ. People will draw attention unduly to themselves. Every follower of Jesus is called by God to glorify him. Every follower of Christ is meant to point with his life to the Lord Jesus. But instead, we sometimes make it about ourselves, showing off our abilities, our intelligence, our accomplishments. There are two qualities that are out of place in the Christian life. And they are self-promotion and self-reliance. Self-promotion, putting yourself in the spotlight. And self-reliance, trusting in your own strength and your own abilities. These qualities are, like I said, all too often seen in the church and particularly even in the pulpits of churches. Many a preacher has ascended to the pulpit hoping to gain some applause Gain some recognition for his prowess in the pulpit, his ability to expound scripture. Many a preacher has stepped into a pulpit trusting in his own strength and his own ability to deliver the word. But it's not just in pulpits. Every believer has the temptation, I think, to grandstand. 
that is to draw attention and, and want praise from others. Later on in 1 Corinthians, we're going to read in chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It doesn't say to the glory of self. The purpose of our lives is to point to Christ. And that's why self-promotion and self-reliance are both vastly out of place in Christian living. Our life is to put the Lord on display, not ourselves. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a second. Because we find both of these problems are addressed in the first five verses here of chapter 2. The problem of self-promotion and self-reliance. Now, if you've been with us, we've walked our way through 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And there was a problem in the Corinthian church. There was actually several problems in the Corinthian church. But the first one to be addressed is this matter of divisions. The church in Corinth was divided against itself, particularly in following people. Some were in the church saying, I follow Paul. Some said, I follow Peter. Others said, I follow Apollos. They were men followers. And this seems to be the problem and the issue that Paul is pointing out here in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians. Why it is wrong to be a man follower. And he's laid out in chapter 1 that God chooses a foolish message, the message of the cross, he chooses foolish people to be his followers, the nobodies. And it should be no surprise to us in chapter 2 then that he chooses a foolish preacher to deliver that message. He doesn't choose the wise, and that was what the Corinthians were lifting up. They wanted to follow the most intelligent and the most, um, most eloquent teachers. Paul says we came not with eloquence, but with simplicity, with a, a humble heart delivering the word of truth. Look in verse 1 of chapter 2. The text begins, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul is going to place himself here as an example. An example of what it is to be a foolish preacher in a sense. The, these verses destroy the notion of self-promotion and self-reliance. And Paul is the example of that. And he's going to set out his life as an example of two particular areas. First of all, a determined focus and a dependent faith. A determined focus and a dependent faith. We'll look at the first. The Apostle Paul had a determined focus on Christ. He was going to focus on the cross rather than himself. And thus, Paul's ministry was not self-focused, it was actually Christ-focused. In a very disciplined and deliberate way, he pointed to Christ in all that he did. See, the opposite of that is pride. And pride is the great enemy of Christian life and ministry. There's always deep down within us a desire of our flesh to be recognized, to want to point to self. Look what I have done. We want to be noticed and celebrated and congratulated. And as I mentioned before, this problem has been all too true of pastors. Because pastors are just like all of us. We want to be liked and affirmed and appreciated. But sometimes that suddenly becomes the motivation for ministry. In other words, we preach or a preacher will deliver the word in hopes of drawing out congratulations. You know, we have a custom, oftentimes in churches, many churches, where after the sermon is preached, the pastor will stand by the door on the way out of the church. And it's to greet people as they go, and it's not a bad tradition. But sometimes I wonder if the preacher is standing there in order to try and draw out some praise. Because everybody has to file past the preacher, and you've got to say something, so say, well, good sermon, preacher, or it was, you really are on it today. 
the uh, longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, Howard Hendricks, called this the glorification of the worm ceremony, where the preacher stands by and is applauded for being just a worm, a, a servant of God. See, the problem is we become prideful. One Southern Baptist preacher many years ago said this, get a room full of Southern Baptist preachers together and you've got enough ego to blow Washington, D.C. off the map. Now that's not just true of Southern Baptists, but all of us. There's this prideful ego within us. See, Paul very deliberately made his ministry about Christ, not about himself. And certainly Paul could have easily become the most popular Christian preacher of his day, couldn't he? Here was a man who was well studied in the Old Testament. He had a dramatic testimony. He had a very successful, wide-reaching ministry. If Paul had wanted to, he could have sold out arenas, signed book deals, headlined conferences. He could have signed autographs, but he didn't. He was determined to make Christ the centerpiece of his ministry. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. We see here Paul's method, his method. Verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Paul came to them with a certain method which reflected his focus. You notice in verse 1, it he begins by introducing the first person pronoun, I. He's gone from you, back in 26 to 31 of chapter 1, to now I. He's going to use himself as an example. He says, I want you to remember how I acted. What was my method when I was among you? That's why he calls them back. He says, when I came to you, remember this, I didn't come with excellence of speech. That word excellence means superior speech or lofty speech. When Paul came to Corinth, he didn't come with a very uh, impressive vocabulary. He didn't try to sound super intelligent or unusually deep. He goes on to say in the verse, he didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom. We've talked about this before, but the Greek word for wisdom is sophia. It's where we get the word sophisticated, and I think that's what he's implying here. He didn't come with excellent, sophisticated, very lofty speech. He spoke in just plain language, plainly laying out the truth. I think there are really two reasons why people speak with big words, technical jargon. There are really two reasons. Number one, sometimes people speak with big words because they share a vocabulary with their audience. We were in a group full of doctors. They might throw around some big words that we don't know, but they all know them because they're all doctors. They've studied these things, and so they can use big words that they're all familiar with. The same with engineers, the same even with theologians sometimes. Uh, I will use on occasion words like atonement and sanctification, and I use them not to be, try and be impressive. I use them because we as a church see those words as biblical, first of all, but also they're words that are in our vocabulary as believers. And hopefully we explain them as we go. There's a second reason people will use big words, and that is they want people to think they're smart. And if you throw out enough big sounding words, people will say, whoa, what an intelligent person. I didn't understand half of what he said, but he sounded really smart. And people would use language that way to make themselves sound very intelligent. Well, he must be trustworthy. He sounds smart. Well, Paul didn't do that. When he says, when I came to you, it wasn't with excellence of speech. It wasn't with sophisticated words. I didn't use technical jargon. I just plainly taught. And what did he teach? The end of verse 1 says, he declared the testimony of God. Some versions might say the mystery of God. There's a variant there, but both refer to the same thing, whether it's mystery or testimony, it's talking about the gospel. The message of the cross. So Paul's method, if I could put it in one word, is simply this, simplicity. He preached with simplicity. 
But we see first his, his method, but secondly his message. His message, that's verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This was his determined focus to preach Christ and him crucified. He had a simple method and he had a single message. You notice, I took this word determined right from Paul's writing here in verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you. He purposed. He decided. That word indicates a choice between multiple options. So Paul could have focused on a lot of things. He could have chosen this. He could have done that. But he said, I made it my narrow focus. I determined. I made a choice to know only Christ and him crucified. Now, we've got to understand what this phrase means, he determined to know only Christ. Let's first of all, identify what it's not about. This doesn't mean some kind of anti-intellectualism. And there, I've used a big word. Anti-intellectualism is to say that anything intelligent is, is off limits. That somehow Paul was saying that we need to all just forget about everything else and just get back to Christ. That we should not focus ever on anything else. I don't think that's what Paul's saying. I don't think he's saying forget everything that you never knew and focus only on Christ. Secondly, it does not imply a dispassionate presentation. In other words, Paul isn't saying I just came in and I read a manuscript as plainly and as uh, simply as possible. He didn't ever get excited. I don't think that's it at all. Number three, it doesn't mean that we preach only evangelistic sermons. This doesn't mean that all we ever preach is the same two or three verses in the New Testament and that's it. Paul didn't do that. He says in Acts chapter 20, he preached the whole counsel of God. So what does it mean to have this determined focus? Well, Paul is saying that he made a decision to focus on the cross of Christ when he preached at Corinth. He could have done lots of other things. He could have determined to help the poor. He could have had very deep theological speeches. He could have planned amazing community activities. He could have railed against the immorality in Corinth. He could have criticized the Roman corruption of his day. He could have preached against slavery or any other social wrong of his day. But he says, I didn't do those things. I focused in on the cross, a message of salvation. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't address any of those things ever. Clearly, Paul talks about many of the things. He talks about Jesus' second coming. He talks about ethics and morality. But it always comes back to the cross for Paul. Because this was his determined focus. It was not going to be about him. It was going to be about Christ and him crucified. And that is the gospel message. That God loved and sent his son for you to die on a cross, pay the penalty of sin, that whosoever believes in him would have everlasting life. That is Paul's message. And so this is a very personal verse to me because that's my message. That's my determined focus to preach Christ and him crucified. See, the problem that we have is that we get away from Christ and him crucified. And primarily, we get on to us, and we get on to the grandstand, where we start to put the spotlight not on the gospel message, not on the truth of Scripture, but on the person who's delivering it. We make it about our excellence of speech. Look at us. Look at how intelligent I look. And it's not just preaching. It's a whole, a whole host of things. I enjoy, from time to time, going to pastor's conferences. It's a good time to be refreshed. It's a good time to be taught and to be preached to instead of actually preaching. A few years ago, I went to a conference where one of the speakers that was featured that year was a, a it actually was a professor of preaching at a seminary and had a very powerful stage presence. He would, instead of working from notes, he would actually memorize his entire sermons and he would recite it go entirely from memory. And he would go from one end of the stage to the other, and he was very dynamic 
He knew when to be loud and when to be quiet. And, and was an excellent preacher, excellent content, too. But I noticed that as we left the auditorium that day, around me, everyone was talking not about the message that was proclaimed, but could you believe that preacher, the way he did it, his approach? Now, he, he's a man who I don't think that was his intention, and I don't think that he wanted the attention. He was just proclaiming the word, but sometimes we get stuck in the spotlight. We're on the grandstand because people notice our words. Let's make it beyond just the pulpit, though. There are a lot of ways for us to grandstand in this life, whether it's in person, on social media, any number of ways. We're always trying to call attention back to us. Look at what I did. And any time the conversation tends to drift away from me, I start to tune out or try and draw the conversation back to me, myself. See, that's self-promotion. That's the very opposite of what the Christian life is to be about. It's about exalting Christ above all. Paul is an example of a determined focus, but secondly, he's an example of a, de of a dependent faith. A dependent faith. On one hand, he was trying to avoid self-promotion. On the other side, he's avoiding self-reliance. So he has a dependent faith to trust God completely. Paul's ministry was not a display of himself and his own cleverness or ingenuity. It was a display of God's strength. And that's what ministry is supposed to be. It is supposed to be something carried out in humility, giving God all the credit, depending on him for strength to do it, and trusting him for the results. It is, his, it is the work of God through and through. Look at verse 3. But I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. These verses reveal a man who has no confidence in his own flesh, in his own abilities. It's someone that trusts in God depends upon him completely. There's no room for bragging. There's no room for pride when you realize you're just a frail, weak vessel. And that's what Paul knew of himself. And if God accomplishes anything through this man, it's a demonstration of God's power, not his own. This kind of dependent faith, first of all, reveals our inability. It reveals our inability. Look again at verse 3. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. That sounds a lot like the first sermon I ever preached. Where I was in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. There's a sense of, overwhelming sense of uh, fear when the first time I stepped into a pulpit. Because I realized, what if I mess this up? What if this comes out as a complete disaster? It seems that that was Paul's way. He approached the pulpit not with confidence, and that's typically the picture we would have of Paul, isn't it? I mean, we imagine Paul strolling confidently into town, walking into the synagogue, snatching up the scroll and saying, let me tell you about Jesus. We don't think of Paul as being fearful. We think of him as being bold. But that's not what he says. He says, when I was here in Corinth, you remember, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. See, God uses foolish, weak, empty pastors, empty preachers to do his will. The word weakness here, he says, I was with you in weakness, can refer to a general weakness, but it can also refer to sickness, illness, poor health. Some have guessed perhaps uh, Paul was suffering when he came to Corinth. Perhaps he was weakened from all the persecution that he had suffered. Perhaps uh, there was some other physical ailment. A lot of people believe that Paul had poor eyesight. That was one of his struggles in life. He came in weakness. We don't know exactly what the weakness was. 
But we know that it wasn't in strength and confidence. He also says that I came in fear. Fear of what? I don't think that Paul was afraid of rejection or persecution or even death. So what was Paul afraid of? Well, I think based on the context here, he was afraid that people would trust in his words, not in God. That he would be lifted up and people would see him instead of seeing Christ. He's in fear and in trembling. So whatever the weakness, whatever the fear, Paul is saying here, I had no confidence in myself. His dependent faith revealed his inability, not his great power, his great strength. It was somebody who came in weakness and in fear. There's an old story told, and I've heard it many times, about a young preacher who was just starting out. And he was very confident. He had spent some time studying his passage. He had even practiced it a few times. He was very excited to have an opportunity to preach. So the older minister gave him a Sunday morning when he would be allowed to preach. And the, the minister sat on the front seat while this young preacher, confidently with his head lifted high, strutted up to the pulpit and began to open up the Bible and start to preach. Everything went really well for about five minutes or so. And suddenly he started stumbling over himself and trying to find the right words. And he, he started tripping up and saying the wrong things. And he started to get a little red in the face and a little bit embarrassed and flushed. And it just kept getting worse and worse from there. Eventually he wrapped it up in some semblance of a conclusion. And with head hanging low, slinked out of the pulpit onto the front row. He sat down next to the older preacher and and said, what went wrong? What happened? The older preacher said, if you had gone up the way that you had come down, you would have come down the way you went up. You see, he went up with confidence and came down humbled. He should have gone up humbled because there is no confidence that we can have in the flesh. It reveals our inability. Secondly, this kind of dependent faith relies on God's power. It relies on God's power. Go to verse 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, no, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. See, Paul didn't rely on his own strengths. He didn't come saying, I spoke with the most powerful, well-written words I could come up with. No, he says, I came not with persuasive words. Paul's speech was simple. This word persuasive or persuasive words here it comes from the Greek word pathos. Pathos is a word that we still use today. If you've ever taken a speech class, you probably learned about ethos, logos, and pathos. Those are the, the forms of persuasion in speech. Pathos refers to the emotional appeal. As you're speaking, you can appeal to people's pathos, that you can bring up some emotional illustration, some kind of gripping story that's going to catch people's attention and convince them. Paul says, I didn't come with a convincing story and a really clever illustration. He didn't come with pathos. He didn't appeal to the emotion. Do we see that happening today? We see that all over the place today. People appealing to emotion. They try to play your emotions to get you to make a decision of some kind. Paul says, that wasn't me. I didn't speak with persuasive words. I didn't try and convince people through my arguments. I came with simplicity, not with wisdom of words, human wisdom. He came with simple speech, simple words, so that people would not trust in him. And Paul was not depending upon his words. He was depending upon the Lord. You know, these uh, words here in verses 3 and 4 are the very opposite, I think, of what most churches are looking for today in a pastor. Here's somebody who has no confidence in himself. He's, he's there in weakness and fear. He's not preaching with persuasive words. But most churches are looking for someone who is confident, good with words, able to preach powerfully. 
In fact, I looked this week, I got onto churchstaffing.com. It's a very popular website where churches will post jobs and, and a lot of uh, pastors are connected to churches through that website. So I got on and I just browsed around through a couple of listings and looked at what they were looking for in a pastor. And here's just three selections that I took from three different listings. This church says they're looking for someone who's an effective and engaging communicator. Another one says that the pastor they're looking for must be a talented speaker, teacher, or preacher, able to consistently engage a large audience. Another church said they're looking for a remarkable, looking for remarkable aptitude for teaching and preaching in an effective manner to reach multiple generations. Now, there's nothing wrong inherently with any of those listings, but I did notice this as I scrolled through. I didn't find any listings that said, we're looking for someone who's going to be with us in weakness and fear and much trembling. We're looking for someone who doesn't use persuasive words of human wisdom. You see, Paul was dependent wholly, not on his abilities or his skills or his education. He was wholly dependent upon God. This kind of dependent faith, third, rejects manipulation. Rejects manipulation. Go on to verse 5. The reason for Paul's method, the reason that he spoke with such simplicity, is that, verse 5, your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul's fear here is that if he uses persuasive words, people will be won over. Wow, Paul, couldn't agree more. You said it so well. But they're trusting in Paul and his words, not Christ and his word. It's a manipulation, this persuasive words, this game that's played to try and convince and win people over. A dependent faith is not interested in manipulation. It trusts God. It trusts not only God to provide the strength necessary, but to provide the results. We don't try to win people. We let the Lord do that. See, there's two enemies of Christian living, two qualities that are so out of place, self-promotion and self-reliance. Both of them are dealt with here in the passage. But I do want to point out a couple other lessons that we see as we go through these verses. We see in these verses, first of all, that manipulation creates false converts. That's why Paul was so opposed to this idea of using persuasive, worldly wisdom. Because it creates people who are followers of men rather than followers of God. And that's the very thing Paul is arguing against. Don't be a follower of men. Manipulation creates followers of people. Many years ago, in 1792, a man named Charles Grandison Finney was born. Growing up, he had no plan on becoming a preacher. Instead, he followed the path of a lawyer. At age 29, he experienced a dramatic conversion in 1821. From that on, time on, he became a, an itinerant preacher, a traveling preacher. He led revivals all over New York State. Now, Charles Finney is a very controversial character. His methods were quite different than any of the revivalists that preceded him. Finney believed and specifically stated that revival is not a miracle, but the result of the right use of appropriate means. In other words, any good preacher ought to be able to create revival wherever he goes, if he knows what he's doing. That was Finney's understanding, at least. And so he would travel from town to town, and he had a very set method, a formula almost, where he would play very emotional music, and he would offer what was called the anxious bench, which was a place for people to sit who were feeling convicted and so on. And not all of Finney's ideas were bad or wrong, but there was a, a play to the emotions. There was a, an appeal through rhetoric and through convincing uh, stage presence, and Finney had a dramatic stage presence. Unfortunately, many people trusted in Finney, not the gospel. The area where he preached in western New York became called the Burnt Out District. The reason, they said, was because the fires of revival have burned it so 
so hard that there's nothing left to burn there anymore. And most of Finney's quote-unquote converts did not follow through in the faith. See, it seems to me that they trusted in the wisdom of men, but not in the power of God. Just one example, that manipulation can create false converts. Second lesson I want to point out, and I want to spend a little time on this one simply because I believe this is the, the place where our church can most likely apply this. God works through weakness. Paul came to Corinth in weakness and in fear. And we think weakness is a handicap. We think that sickness, infirmity, disability, weakness of any kind is a handicap. And we say things like, well, I can't serve God because of fill in the blank. I can't serve God because of my physical condition. I can't serve God because I don't speak that well. I can't serve God because I'm not that talented. Well, see, these verses seem to be saying to me that weakness is not a handicap. It's actually what God is looking for. He works through weak vessels. It's not only the, the powerful communicators and the uh, incredible movers and shakers that God uses, but simple, weak people. If you're a weak person, without a lot to offer, that shouldn't be viewed as a handicap. We should be saying, I guess God wants to use me. Because God uses weak vessels. And as I think of myself, and I think of the people in this church, many of us are weak vessels. But that's not, that shouldn't discourage us, that should encourage us to say, how does God want to use my weakness for his glory? Third, the power is in the message, not the messenger. This is the argument, I think, that is pressing through all the way through chapter 1, now into chapter 2. Don't follow men. Men are just messengers. The power is in the gospel message itself. Proclaim it with simplicity. You don't have to dress it up. It has power. The power to change lives. I'm inviting us this morning to give up the grandstand. That's where we place ourselves sometimes. Maybe we don't even think about it. We just almost reflexively make everything about us. And we trust in ourselves. We promote ourselves. This morning, let's follow the example of Paul. Give up the grandstand and, and tr make it about Christ. As Paul said in, chap in chapter 2, verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified.